The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to another episode of V Brown Bag. Uh, we are continuing our Azure series. Tonight we have Mark Morin uh, Morinsky, and he's going to be discussing Azure identity with Active Directory. As always, this is meant to be a social experience, so please do join in on the conversation. Uh, if you have any questions and you are live in the audience, feel free to ask through GoToWebinar uh, or via Twitter, right? So at V Brown Bag or using, using our hashtag. I'm your host, Rebecca Fitzhugh, and without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mark. Hey, everybody. Um, while I'm getting the presentation set up here, um, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, so I'm Mark Morzinski. I'm a program manager in the identity product group. We cover uh, Azure Active Directory, Active Directory, Active Directory Federation services are probably the big three. So for, for, this, um, for this webinar, I was kind of trying to think of like where to kind of start at, because Azure AD is kind of a, a big topic, and I feel like there's quite a bit of misinformation out there around it, and <clears throat> some people get kind of confused. And at a conference recently, I had someone come up to me and say, hey, um, how many domain controllers do I need to put in Azure to run Azure AD? And it was like, I, I like where your head's going, right? Like they Azure AD, I have an AD on-prem, I should put it in Azure, and we'll make this work. And I said, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is you need zero domain controllers in, uh, in Azure to run Azure AD. But the bad news is you have quite a bit of uh, learning you need to do about kind of understanding what Azure AD is. So I thought for this session, I would kind of give um, this overarching view of kind of like the bits and pieces of Azure AD and, and the kind of use cases and kind of where we're coming at things from. And then if there is specific topics that you guys want to have like a much deeper dive on, I'm more than happy to kind of come back and we can do like a full hour on MFA or SaaS apps or whatever the specific thing is. So this one's going to be kind of like an overview sting. And I should also add, so I'm on a team specifically that works with customers on their deployments of Azure AD. So I'm down in the weeds with everybody that's actually living and breathing this stuff every day. So I can kind of talk to some of the stuff here, what other customers I'm working with are doing, so maybe some things you should think about doing if you haven't done so already. So that's kind of um, where I'll go. The slides look a little um, look a little marketing-ish because they're professionally built, not by myself like someone in engineering, but uh, don't be discouraged. I will kind of talk through some of the engineering parts behind it and some things to do and some things not to do. So that's kind of where this thing's gonna go. So first of all, um, why identity is important. Um, you guys probably already know this, but really identity has become kind of the attack point. And it always has been the attack point of like where thefts happen. So people are getting their credentials um, stolen either you know by by phishing or, or something like that. Um, you know, they use the same password on different sites and services. So when one of those services gets uh, compromised, your username pass their username and passwords are in the wild, or even um, easily guessable passwords like password spray, right? So where um, bad guys know like, okay, if your password policy changes every three months, someone's going to have a password that is probably going to be summer 2018. And since it's you have to have a special character, that special character is going to be the exclamation point and it will always be at the end, right? And the first letter is always capital and they kind of know that and they, basically do a password spray attack against your users and 1% of your users are going to get hit by that. And once they compromise that identity, they can go off and do some bad stuff. So identity is really the thing that we want to make sure we're securing and we're, we're, we're protecting. Um, so kind of to kind of just lay the groundwork, I'll, I'll move kind of quick through this. Um, before the cloud was a thing and all that kind of good stuff, right? Everybody had their on-prem environment. You have your guys have your private cloud stuff, right? Um, and we have all users in AD, we have all our devices joined to AD. Our apps are probably Kerberos or LDAP or something like that. Everything stays on-prem and all our data stays on-prem. And that worked for a long time. And now we've started moving into this world where we have all these clouds apps and SaaS services, right? And people use Slack and Google apps and Salesforce and everything under the sun and all these kind of apps live out there. And then to kind of add on to that, we're no longer using our personal 
work device, right? Uh, that doesn't really make any sense. Our work mandated device, right? Like you get assigned to a laptop when you start and that's the only place you do your work. It doesn't really happen anymore. Everybody has their email on their phone. A lot of times it's their personal phone. Sometimes they're using it on the iPad or you know, whatever. Um, people can use their Amazon Echoes to check their calendar. So you're starting to get all this stuff that's kind of like escaping from your environment. And then also how you're collaborating with other um, organizations. So you probably have some business partners and maybe you even have, you're getting into the social identity space. So you kind of have this, this hodgepodge of just kind of stuff going everywhere. So I don't, um, this is what we're kind of seeing and this is what I'm seeing with other customers. And really, you probably heard us talk about it, but we say that identity is the control plane. And if you can kind of control that, um, that kind of really helps you get your arms around the situation that you're in and kind of get some governance around this and some compliance and all that kind of kind of good stuff. So um, we look at it really, like I said, is identity is the control plane and I'll kind of talk through all this throughout the thing, but really you're gonna still have your on-prem active directory today. That's not going away anytime soon. They're gonna sync your identities up to Azure AD and up from there, you can use those to connect to um, all kinds of cloud apps, not just Microsoft apps like Office 365, but Salesforce, AWS, it doesn't really matter to Azure AD. Azure AD is gonna be that identity provider. And then you can also do BYOD with uh, Intune and you can do some Windows 10 stuff with hybrid Azure AD join, and Azure AD join, which we'll kind of touch on that real quick. And then you also have like how you're going to work through um, with your other partners, right? So you might be using a business partner, sharing documents, doing some sort of collaboration. They might be using Ping Federate for that. And then you might even have a thing where you're using some sort of consumer-based um, identity provider as well to access maybe something that your company is providing. So, you know, so when you see like those little like logins, like, like login with your Facebook account or login with your Twitter account, things like that, um, Azure AD can also, can also help with that. That's our B2C feature. Um, so this is like, uh, you're probably gonna see this a lot. Um, we're recording this in end of August, um, about a month before our conference in Orlando, which is Microsoft Ignite, where I'm sure we will um, have all kinds of amazing new things and all that good stuff. But this is just kind of the stats, so uh, pay no mind. The thing that you just really need to pay attention to though, is that um, if you have Office 365, you have Azure AD, like you already have it. If you're using Azure, you have Azure AD, right? So you already have Azure AD, it's the underlying directory for all this stuff. So you probably already have this. Okay, so um, Azure AD kind of has these four different pillars that we kind of try to solve. And I'll kind of break these into use cases, which is kind of where this is gonna go to. But really, um, we wanna provide seamless access to resources. And that's really kind of important from a security proof perspective of as well, because every time uh, your users are putting their usernames and passwords in some other site, you guys are losing control of that, as well as like now the security of there, like now if they get compromised, those username and passwords also get compromised. And users tend to use the same username and password, which we all know is, is not good, but that's what they do. And you don't totally blame them a little bit, right? Because like, let's say that they're gonna use Box or something like that to like collaborate on a document. So they have to make a Box account and they're like, oh, well, this is for work. I should probably use my work account, right? And they put in their work username and then they're like, oh, well, I don't wanna have to remember another password. So they put in the same password, right? So they put their work password in there. So that's kind of like how that happens. And we'll kind of talk through some of the single sign-on stuff for that. And then we wanna like really facilitate collaboration. This is where our B2B feature kind of comes in and it makes it easy and seamless to kind of do that kind of stuff. And then we're really about um, helping IT be much more efficient, which I know probably sounds like a like a marketing buzzword, which kind of is a little bit, but there's some like really cool stuff that you can do as an IT administrator in your environment that will help make like make the business more efficient and drive this stuff. Because at the end of the day, like nobody does IT for the sake of IT, right? Like somebody, you're doing this because you're trying to provide value to the business in some shape or form. So the more IT can kind of like make the business more efficient and kind of get out of the way of stuff, the better it is for everybody. Like you don't have to deal with that kind of stuff anymore. The business can keep moving. It's good to go. And then finally, um, enhance your security compliance. You can do so many cool things um, with Azure AD from a security perspective 
that you cannot do with on-prem AD. Like you are more secure with this stuff in Azure AD than you are with on-prem AD by far. So um, Azure AD is made up of a ton of stuff. Like there is all kinds of stuff in here. And um, so just kind of like walking through these things one by one, um, we're gonna kind of group them together in some, some use cases that I'll talk to you and then um, take questions, that's fine. And uh, if there's a specific area that we wanna do like a real deep dive on, uh, like I said, I'm happy to come back and do another thing and we can kind of talk through a specific area that's, that's really, uh, really interesting to you. So, okay. So let's kind of get through the first use cases. I wanna provide my employees access to every app from any location and any device. So what does that like really mean like when we get down to it? So really we're talking about um, being in a hybrid state and like how do you do that easily? How do you get access to all of these applications that we talked about like Workday and Salesforce and all that kind of stuff. But realistically, like I said, you wanna use one identity for this, right? Because the more identities that people have, they're, they're susceptible to attack and they have to remember everything. And besides it being um, a poor end user experience, um, you can really in increase your security. So let's kind of talk about like, what does that kind of look like? So the first thing is Azure AD has all this cool stuff, but you're going to use Azure AD Connect to sync your users to Azure AD. If you've been around long enough, this used to be called DurSync. Some people still call it DurSync. You should not be running DurSync anymore if you're running DurSync. Um, I'm pretty sure the endpoint that DurSync uses is, is turned off, so you're probably probably broken. So um, make sure you're on Azure AD Connect. Uh, super easy to deploy. Um, keep up to date. Um, they come out with new updates about every month. I don't think you have to be um, like super religious about it and getting on the latest build every single month. But I would say don't fall behind too far because that's a lot of things you have to get through and just there's a lot of bug fixes and changes and all that kind of good stuff. So um, make sure you can keep this up to date. And this basically is the main, like I said, this is the main sync engine and it lets you do some seamless authentication mechanisms here, which, which is the next part of the story. So um, the first way you can uh, connect to Azure AD and when you see Azure AD, like just in your brain, you can see it as like slash Office 365, right? Because that's sometimes people call it that. But um, it's being federated. So we support federation. You can use ADFS, uh, Ping Federate, like SiteMinder, whatever you want to use to federate. Um, there's a whole list online. You can take a look, and that's what's supported. Um, this used to be, I would say, the, the primary method. People authenticated, and like this was the default first choice. But uh, I'm here to tell you that you don't have to do federation. There's some cool stuff here that you can do and get a same user experience without having to do federation because federation, um, if you have it set up already, you're probably familiar. Like cert rollover is super painful. Um, and there's like an overhead cost of maintaining multiple DFS servers and WAP servers and all that kind of stuff. So um, you don't have to do a uh, federation. Uh, that's the first thing here. Okay, but the second thing, is password hash synchronization. So uh, everybody should turn this on. Even if you have federation on, you can still use password hash sync. And um, we have a really good white paper about this on like, how does it work? But I'll kind of give you the like the gist of it. Okay. The first thing is um, every place I go to, every customer I work with, they always tell me the same thing. They go, like to turn it on, but we have a policy no passwords in the cloud. It's the only policy that I know that IT security has blanketly agreed on. I don't know, they all got together one day and they're like, we're not doing this, right? And everyone kind of agreed. So first thing, good news, password hash sync is not putting your passwords in the cloud. It's putting it into hashes. And they're actually a hash of a hash. It's hashed a thousand times with uh, SHA-256 with salt per user that's syncing it to Azure AD. So um, why do you care? Like, well, let's just get to the brass tacks. Like, well, why do I care about this? There's two big reasons why you want to turn on password hash sync. The first thing is we have a thing called leaked credentials, okay? And what that is, is Microsoft works with law enforcement and our security researchers and our, um, oh, what's that group called? It like takes down botnets and all that kind of good stuff. <clears throat> Basically, when we find 
usernames and passwords like on pastebin or you know wherever wherever you're going to find them we will take those clear text username and passwords that um that we find and we'll put the clear text password through the same hashing algorithm as your the hash that's stored in azure ad and if those hashes match that means that somewhere your corporate or i should say a user's corporate username and password is stored somewhere on the internet okay we will alert you of that and you should immediately reset that user's password so you cannot find out that unless you're syncing your password hashes that's the first thing the second thing which may save your job is if something goes horribly wrong to your on-prem active directory environment or just like some sort of data center thing some sort of catastrophe of some kind uh, you can use password hash sync you can flip your authentication mechanism to be authenticating against azure ad directly so you might think like that'll never happen to me like we got backups we got stuff like we got our act together this is not a problem for me um take a look at what happened with uh the wanna cross stuff take a look what happened with the NotPetya stuff uh there was people that got like really hit bad with this right and um when you think about it when you flip this on so you say okay something horrible has happened to my ad right the whole thing is down we flip it to be authenticated against azure ad office 365 all your environment your still users still work everyone can still authenticate and they're going to use the same username and password that they've been using on-prem so that's good you don't have to change anything you don't have to tell anybody to do anything but probably more importantly your it department can use corporate resources to communicate and bring the environment back because if you don't have that people are going to be emailing each other you know server names probably ip addresses probably passwords to stuff as we're resetting everything and if you don't have this that means people will be using their personal email accounts so you'll have all that kind of really good corporate data in people's like gmail hotmail yahoo mail comcast.net you name it all over the place no retention policies no governance none of that like all that goes out the window if in that environment in that situation so turn on password hash sync um if you have a reason why you can't turn on password hash sync that is grounded in a technical reality and or some sort of like legit compliance framework or something please 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 tell me you can uh at me on twitter at mark morrow please tell me get a hold of me i would love to hear why there's a reason why we cannot turn this on so you should definitely be um turning this on okay the sec, uh, third way you can authenticate is kind of a newer method that uh, eh, it's probably been out for a little over a year. It's called pass-through authentication. And what that does is a user puts in their username and password into a form in Azure AD. And then Azure AD, um, there's a connector on-prem, is constantly uh, listening and reaching out. Basically, it's on the Azure service bus looking for credentials. It takes those credentials and it applies them against on-prem active directory so you're authenticating against your on-prem active directory and then in basically if it says yep looks good goes back tells azure ad and the user gets authenticated in so you're authenticating against your on-prem ad so not pictured here on this slide let's do the whole thing so he's, these are your three uh three choices right so you can either do federation pass through hash sync or pass through auth uh, not pictured is another feature called seamless SSO. And you can use that with pass through auth or password hash sync. And basically that gets you the same single sign on experience like you do with ADFS, but you don't have to have the overhead of all the ADFS environment. And you can use that with password hash sync or pass through auth. The difference is password hash sync, you're authenticating directly against Azure AD. Pass through auth, you're authenticating against your on prem Active Directory. In either case, though, if you're any of those, you should always have, like I said, password hash sync on. Okay. Okay. So that's how your users are going to authenticate to Azure AD. And then we get to um, the app story. So I'm sure this number is going to change once uh, someone updates it, probably for Ignite. But uh, point of this slide is 
Azure AD is the identity, like a IDAS provider. We're the IDP for all this stuff. We work with ISVs to get apps integrated into the gallery. We can do provisioning and deprovisioning to some of these SaaS apps as well. Um, it's really, it's really good. Um, the first, the most popular app is actually Office 365, but these are the, this is the list of the third party apps. So whoever was like elbowing their buddy, like, ah, oh, look, I see Google apps number one. Um, this is third party apps only, but yeah, Google apps, super popular. Um, Workday service now, probably all the stuff that you guys are really familiar with and uh, probably are using in your environment. Um, we work with these uh, ISVs to get integrated into the gallery. We actually um, get a lot of traction when customers tell their ISV that they want them to be in the Azure AD app gallery, which kind of forces them to do this. And then it makes it better for everybody because everyone can now use that app. So um, think about it. Um, I have some customers that are really good about doing this and it actually helps everybody uh, in this space. Like one of my customers is actually, we have some Jamf integration and they've been driving that whole thing with Jamf and kind of working together with us to make sure that works correctly and it works as expected. So um, good stuff. Uh, second thing here, we have a feature. Um, this is technically part of Microsoft MCAS, but there's a piece in the Azure AD which lets you look into see what SaaS apps are being used in your environment. You basically upload the firewall logs, does some processing, all kinds of good stuff, tells you what's going on. Um, this is not my area per, per se, so I don't have a ton of knowledge about it, but um, it is an eye-opening experience for most customers. So a couple scenarios. Maybe this will apply to you. Um, the, one customer is trying to determine, should they go for Box or um, Dropbox? So they ran through the numbers and saw that a large part of the environment was already using Dropbox. So that was made an easy decision. And okay, that's what we're gonna do, right? So use some data to drive that decision because most of the business was already using Dropbox. Good stuff. Uh, the flip of that, they were a customer, they are heavy, heavy, OneDrive, OneDrive shop, okay? That's where the compliance is, that's where the policies are, all that good stuff. One pipe these things through, and we saw lots of data going every which way, right? Besides OneDrive. So go into Dropbox, go into Box, go into G Drive, like just going every which way. And the compliance people like had a minor heart attack, right? Because all their data is going all over the place. So you can figure out um, where your stuff is and what people are using in your environment. And it may be like shadow IT is kind of like the marketing term for that. That's like a real thing. Like that is for sure happening in your environment. And this will help you kind of see that. You can kind of bring those apps like into the fold and kind of like get them managed and all the good stuff that goes with that. So um, super cool. Okay. Another awesome feature we have is called Azure AD application proxy. And what this, if you have, if you know of like, if you go way back and you know like TMG or ISA server, God help you. And then you get to UAG, right? This is kind of like the next evolution of that. Um, basically it's a reverse proxy, taking your on-prem apps, web apps and publishing them outbound into Azure AD. And then you can basically grant access, which we'll get to how you do that, um, like any other SaaS app. So this is super useful, um, it's all, those arrows really should be going the other way because it's all up on connectivity. Uh, but basically you can um, really do some good stuff here. So I have a customer, they are an ISP. So that's like people in trucks, like running cables, salespeople in the field, like doing stuff, right? Like they're on the move. And they have an internal web app that they use for like ticket tracking or sales leads or whatever they're doing, who knows? And everybody had to go home every night and fire up the laptop, fire up the VPN, go into this web form and like log a time, all that good stuff. But they put app proxy in. They took this on-prem app, they published it through app proxy, they did conditional access, which I'll get to here in a little bit. And they basically said, okay, in order to get to this app, you have to come from a managed device or you have to do MFA and all kinds of good stuff, which we'll get to. And there are people, Loved it. It was like amazing. They had they did 30 of their web apps in 30 days. And then after that, they had other business units coming to them asking them, hey, how do I get my app into this? Because like we want to do the same thing. Because it really helped break away from this, like get the laptop out, got a VPN in, all that good stuff. 
you could really do some good stuff to the business. And you could do this by making zero changes to the app. Like they didn't have to make any app changes. It's all, the proxy does all that stuff. It's web, web based. So super cool. If you have some sign of app that does um, header based off, um, we work with ping access to kind of do those header based off apps. Um, so if you have some sort of real legacy app that does that, you can also publish those through app proxy. Okay. Uh, next thing, Azure AD domain services. So people get a little uh, confused with this. Um, I get it, our naming is a little confusing at times. So basically what this is, is um, you have your on-prem active directory, right? And we use Azure AD Connect to sync our users up, our groups up, whatever we're gonna sync up there, those are in Azure AD. Azure AD domain services basically is two Azure, or two domain controllers in Azure that are staged from your Azure Active Directory. So you can use this, this plays a really nice scenario when you guys are trying to lift and shift apps out of your data center into Azure and they need some type of LDAP authentication, you're trying to apply group policies, you know, something like that, some sort of app that we're not gonna modernize so we're gonna let it still do NTLM for some reason, right? So whatever reason. So in the past, you probably would have had to create a new, another domain controller in Azure IaaS, right? You would have to probably do like a site to site. That's, that's definitely a new Active Directory site. Probably have to do maybe Express Route or some sort of site to site VPN maybe. And then we gotta sync all that data up, you know, we're syncing it to the regular domain controller, all that kind of stuff. Um, there's quite a bit, right, with that. There's a lot to kind of keep that baby humming. Um, Azure AD Domain Services just does all that and staged from your, um, from your Azure Active Directory. So super cool, super useful. And you basically just, um, like it's just an Azure IaaS thing at that point. So you can put them on like, put them on the VNet, right? And then your apps talk to it and you're good to go. So um, super straightforward, super cool, and kind of gets you out of having to do this, a lot of overhead of management of trying to get an I, a DC into Azure IaaS. Okay, next scenario. I want my customers and partners to kind of uh, access the apps they need and kind of collaborate. So this is kind of where our B2B and, and B2C scenario comes into play. So B2B is part of Azure Active Directory. You can think of that as like collaboration, you know? So let's say I am an airline and I'm going to work with um, some sort of parts manufacturer to build engine, you know, piece parts for the engine. I will have a B2B relationship with them. Maybe I'm sharing a dock, whatever I'm gonna do. And then um, that's where that kind of falls in. The B2C realm is much more like business to consumer. So myself as an individual would buy a plane ticket on that airline. Like that's where the B2C thing and the B2B is more of the collaboration if that, if that kind of makes sense. So what does that actually look like? Um, so we have our Azure AD, you know, this is all normal what you're doing today. And now you wanna work with another organization so you can share that, share with them. Um, you know, SharePoint stuff, whatever you want. Basically, okay, so what happens under the hood on this thing? Um, when you invite a user, a B2B user stub account gets created in your tenant, like your directory, okay? This is kind of important, but it's still good. So uh, all of the authentication of that user takes place in their directory. So if they're federated, password hashing, whatever, doesn't matter, you don't know anything about it, you don't care anything about it, they have to authenticate over there first, and then the claim gets sent over to Azure AD, and then once you're in that, then they're a guest user in your directory, they can't really do anything, and then you can grant them access to whatever other resources you want. So uh, SharePoint's a big one for this, um, but I have customers doing this with like CRM apps, right, that maybe they have a vendor they're working with, and they're gonna help manage some stuff. So basically they invite them over, then they grant them access to the CRM app, just like any other employee. And they're able to um, able to go ahead and do that. Um, now, if they don't have Azure AD, that's okay. If they don't have a tenant yet, they will create a Microsoft account underneath for them um, magically. And uh, we are working on getting some other identity providers like access as well. So. Pay attention to Ignite, we'll have some cool stuff probably for that. Um, okay. Uh, 
The other thing you can do here, two other things I should say, that my other customers do. So it's not really in the slide, but we'll kind of talk to it. We have a feature called terms of use. It's like not as super exciting, but basically like you can throw up a terms of use page before somebody gets access to a resource. Lots of my customers have a standard template that external users have to agree to. You can put that on for your B2B users. So they have to agree to that before they can get access to anything. Super straightforward, shows when they accept it and all that kind of good stuff. Um, other thing you can do, you can require B2B users to have to do MFA before accessing any of your resources. You can do that as part of, part of B2B. Okay, um, B2C. So this thing is uh, totally like white gloved, well, I'm sorry, white labeled. You will never know that this is a Microsoft um, service underneath. Like you can totally hide all that stuff if you want. It basically lets you use social identities to access uh, resources. Um, this is a separate tenant. So this would not be, this is a separate directory than your current probably like production directory. And um, some scenarios this is, is like our big one is Real Madrid where um, you can, like if you go to Real Madrid and you sign up on their mobile device, you can sign in with your Facebook account or whatever you want. And then like you can follow players and get score updates and all that kind of good stuff. Um, you will not see any Microsoft branded in there at all. You can totally customize everything you want. So like you can totally do whatever you want from this. And it's kind of like a bring your own identity thing. Um, some governments are also using this as like, government resources to say like, oh, I'm a citizen. So I'm gonna use my citizen ID to log into this app and everyone kind of gets us an ID and kind of do all kinds of stuff with this. So uh, it basically gets you out of the business of having to manage these accounts, um, which can sometimes be very, very painful. Okay. Uh, third scenario, I wanna automate identity lifecycle and cut down the health costs. Okay, so nobody, this is just like part of doing business. Um, Azure AD, so this is kind of like a question we get sometimes is like, well, I already have ADFS. I have my SaaS apps in ADFS. Why do I need to do this? And ADFS is a secure token service. Like it thing just issues out tokens and that's it, right? Doesn't, there's nothing more to it. Azure AD is an identity and access management tool. So you can do all kinds of cool stuff. So the first thing you can do here is is with dynamic groups which is amazing because you have a user gets hired right so you have an hr app so some hr apps can provision directly to azure ad so depending on how complex your hr onboarding process is which i'm sure it's probably very complicated because everyone's is very complicated but okay so somehow we'll just we'll talk through this here a little bit um somehow this user gets into active directory on-prem right like this already happens for you today they get hired whatever Object exists, whatever, good to go. Azure AD Connect will automatically, right? Your got your sync engine running, it picks up the user, drops them in Azure AD. And then based on attributes of that user, we can use dynamic groups to like grant access to things and do all kinds of cool fun stuff. So let's say that this user is a member of the sales group. So they have, they get hired, they have sales in their department, they go to Azure AD, uh, Dynamic group picks them up, says sales, they ac automatically get access to Salesforce. And with that, we do provisioning and deprovisioning to that SaaS app as well. So this user can show up on the first day, they show up in AD and automatically, right? They get synced up to active Azure AD because they have sales in the department. They get put into a group automatically and that group grants access to Salesforce. And because we have provisioning turned on, Azure AD will automatically provision them into Salesforce. And you didn't have to do anything. This person just logs in and now they have Salesforce. Awesome. So you can kind of get out of that business of having to like create accounts or delete accounts on the SaaS app side. Super, super useful. Next one, self-service password reset. A um, Couple of things with this. This is the number one cost of, uh, it's usually like number one or number two help desk driver. No one likes calling the help desk. Um, Gartner, I think throws a number around. It's like 70 bucks per password reset. I don't know. Everywhere I've worked, that's like, you know, man hours lost and all that kind of stuff. I don't know. I've not worked at, I've worked at different places. Um, I don't know. $70 seems very high to me, but, um, places that are like legit outsourcing your help desk get charged per password reset. 
that's not like funny money. That's like real money that's going out the door. Um, so, that, so the cell service password reset is one of the most popular features, but also one of the easiest features to implement. And uh, so some tips around that. First tip, go get your help desk logs today and figure out how many cases are in there. Like per, per six months, per month, whatever you wanna do, go pull all that data, get it prepared. Then when you deploy password, cell service password reset, pull that same data after like two months and show that there's been a huge decrease in help desk calls. Super easy to show the value of this. Second thing, not obvious either. Um, our password reset tool does not let you put in easily guessable passwords by default. So that like summer 2018 exclamation point, we just like tell you no, too guessable, you can't use it, okay? Second thing, or third thing, it changes your, it has the ability to change your on-prem AD password as well. Uh, you have to turn on password right back. This is all documented, super straightforward, but um, it respects any of your on-prem AD password policies. So if you have like some crazy password filter DRL because you gotta make sure that this thing like doesn't set a password that's like breaks Oracle's database over here or whatever over there, right? We all know that, um, that's all respected. So goes down, tries to set the password, if it's successful or not, tells the user you can reset your password. So super easy to do. Um, do your homework first, roll it out slowly. You can scope it to users and groups. Um, you can use MFA as a factor. You can use the Authenticator app as a factor now. Um, super easy to feature deploy, good stuff. Go, go, go take a look. Um, Azure AD joined for Windows 10. So there's a lot kind of, uh, this is a very meaty topic and we could spend a whole hour on this alone, but I'll just kind of give you like the high points here. Okay, first thing, Windows 10, you can join to Azure AD directly. You don't have to do domain join anymore. You just do it directly and you still get like Kerberos tickets and all kinds of good stuff. Everything still works. You can do this and you're gonna manage that device now using Intune or some other MDM basically. Then you get all up in Azure. Um, if your account, if your machines are still domain joined, which I'm sure they are, we have this thing called hybrid Azure AD join, which will automatically register the device for you in Azure AD. Probably like, why do I want to do that? Who cares? Um, you can use that to do conditional access stuff, which I'm going to talk to you about next. But basically, um, there's a lot going on here. Um, this is one of the best things you can do though, in terms of, um, it, really go in the weeds here. Um, it also gives you a special type of token called the uh, primary refresh token, which will cut down on your users uh, single sign-on attempts and things like that. And we could do a whole session on that, but um, take a look at this. Uh, you can do Azure AD join directly, or you can do the, like I said, the hybrid Azure AD join. Okay, fourth scenario, security stuff, right? Okay, so these four pillars, like I kind of talked about, um, providing the seamless access, the collaboration, all this stuff, really kind of all build to being like, if you improve any of these, you're improving your security. So let's kind of get to this. Like, what do we care about this? Um, we'll kind of dig in here. Okay, so our most popular feature, I would say is a feature called conditional access. And basically what you're doing, and everyone should be doing this, if you're not doing it already, is you can kind of create these policies, you can create these policies based on, hey, these users or these groups, if they're coming from these types of devices, so like I said, you have the hybrid Azure AD joined or Intune managed or whatever it's gonna be, and you're coming from you know, inside the corporate network or outside the corporate network, you can kind of do different things. You're trying to access these apps. We can then do some stuff around this and we basically can do some machine learning, our real-time engine, which I'll get to next. And we can then say the policy for this user, we're gonna grant these separate controls. So we can do stuff like, okay, they're coming from a corporate device on the corporate network, we just allow them access. But if they're coming from home, we want them to do MFA, you can do that. Or you can say, oh, actually this app is really important. It's an HR app. We wanna make sure that if they're gonna access this, they come from a corporate device, 
and they have to do MFA, and the device has to be like in a good state from Intune. You can do all those types of configurations, however many you want to do, right? Um, to that. So allow access MFA, limited access. So let's say that they're trying to get to SharePoint, but they're on their like Thanksgiving. So they're out at their like aunt's house or whatever, right? So you gotta use like your aunt's computer and it's like a little dicey. But um, you still want people to be able to get to do the things. Maybe you have them do MFA and they can only read stuff. They can't download anything. You can do stuff like that. You can also do a password reset, which is super cool. So like I talked about with the leak credentials, we flag that user as high risk. So like something horrible has happened to this user account. So you can either do block, which some people do. They say, okay, for user risks that are high, we just block them. They can't do anything. They got to call the help desk. We'll deal with it that way. Totally fair. Or you can force them to do a password reset. So on the next login that they do, they'll have to do MFA and then reset their password, which is super cool. Because if you think about it, somewhere, who knows where on the internet, this user's account got exposed. And you and IT might not even know anything about this, right? Like you just come into work, whatever, you have no idea. Gets exposed, we pick it up, we say, hey, user is high risk. And then that user has, when the next login that they do, they will have to do password reset, remediating that risk, right? Because now the password's changed, the one on the internet, who cares, it's not right, it's over. And they've like now moved forward, right? So we, not only did you guys as IT people you didn't have to like really, you didn't have to do anything, but a risk that you weren't even aware of is like resolved. That's amazing, like that's so cool. Now, some other like stories from the trenches here on this. Customers got this on, whatever, things look good. Um, they noticed four leaked credentials from one of their, the countries that they work in. And it's not unheard of, it's fine, you know, it's gonna happen. But three of those accounts, were service accounts, which is like not good at all, right? So we send their incident response team in there, right? Do our thing, collect the data, sort it all out, good to go. We set the passwords, like issue resolved, okay? Move on. Three months later, leaked credentials show up again for those same three service accounts. So clearly they were not good to go, but secondly, Whatever they thought they, the compromise was, was not the compromise, right? Because now these three accounts got compromised again. So real good stuff with that. Make sure you turn on password hash sync and you can do these password resets or you can deny based on the user. And this applies, so I'm talking about all this stuff, applying to SharePoint online, all that kind of stuff. You can also apply all of these conditional access policies to your on-premise applications using App Proxy. So like I said, that scenario where the uh, customer had people in trucks doing all that good stuff. They were able to say that in order to get to this app, the timing app, you know, the time card app for the users, they had to come from an Intune managed device that had to be in compliance. They're using a managed browser, so they weren't exposing the data anywhere else. And they had to do MFA before they could actually access anything. And once they did that, they could go to the app and log in and do all the stuff. So you can do all that to your on-prem apps without making any changes to your on-prem app. Super cool. Um, MFA providers, so we support obviously uh, Azure AD MFA, but we also support RSA Duo and Trusona, as well as an MFA provider. Uh, okay, so all this is built on the intelligent security graph. You'll probably hear all of us talk more about this later. Um, but basically like we share data with like the office team and the digital crimes unit. And when we see stuff happening against Microsoft accounts, we use that to inform things and, and protect your enterprise accounts and all that. So basically, we have this huge, awesome intelligence security graph that does like 10 billion logs a day or something, some crazy amount of stuff. Um, we can get look into that more later if you want, but in another session, but basically this is what this is built on top of. So one of the things we use with that is this thing called Azure AD Identity Protection. So we have Schrodinger's user instead of the cat, right? This someone thinks they're being funny in the slide. So they write the cats both dead and alive until you open the box. So the user is both Good and bad until we do some stuff to it. So, right, so the user goes to log in. I'll kind of walk you through how this works. All right, so this user seems like a good login. We throw it through our analysis, which is, you know, the behavior of the user, some other threat data that we have, 
um, all the logging stuff that we process. And we make a call. Was this person, was it the true negative? This is a valid login. Yes, we were right. And then we throw that into the, the learner tool, the, uh, the learner system, I should say. It does, up, we update this and we redeploy this classifier back out there and this happens every day. Or we thought it was good and it actually was bad. It's a false negative, we missed it. That's not good. Again, the tool learns, updates that gets updated, gets pushed out. Same thing for user seems bad. We were right, we blocked them. Again, machine learns and the same thing. Oh, we thought they were bad, but they're actually good because, you know, looks like the users never logged in from here before, but then they successfully completed an MFA challenge. So now it's actually good that they're a good login. So this is kind of like the machine learning underneath and this all happens seamlessly. You don't have to really do anything. Um, but basically, as the users use the system and they do MFA challenges and you reset passwords and all that kind of stuff, the machine learns on your tenant and it gets better and better. And we keep redeploying this, the updates to this, to this learner and to the classifier. Okay. All right. Uh, home stretch. Privileged identity management. I'll kind of summarize this thing here. Um, this is one of the, I would say, top three or four things that you can do that's Super, super important. I know I said that a lot, but okay. So basically what this is, this basically removes permanent admin credentials. So uh, people don't need to be an admin in the middle of the night. Maybe they do like 10 minutes worth of admin work a week. We all know that guy that doesn't really do anything. Um, doesn't need to have admin credentials all the time. So the users have to, like the admin will have to elevate their rights to become an administrator and then once the timing has expired they go back to being a regular regular user so please 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 look into this a couple things uh this only impacts your administrators like this is no end user touching no client os upgrade or office client touching all that stuff none of this stuff this is just your admins and it's super Super easy to do. We have a white paper kind of a walkthrough of this. If you go to aka.ms slash break glass, we walk you through how to do this. And like I said, like the first week, the first week all you do is you add this to your tenant and then you do nothing. You just watch and you see what happens and you see who has your admin access, who's trying to do stuff. And I've had customers that they've found accounts they're trying to do administrative things now and they shouldn't be and that all gets flagged and then you import your global admins you make them eligible and you do this for your exchange people and you start getting rid of all these crazy scripts that people are running that they shouldn't be running with crazy permissions and you start getting through all this another super cool feature of this that you can do again it's not in the slide is you can schedule the elevation so if you have a change management window and you have a change control board like i'm sure everybody does Okay, we're gonna make this change to exchange or whatever we're gonna do. Um, we're gonna do this um, at 10 p.m. on Saturday to like 6 a.m. So you can make it so that nobody has admin access until that 10 p.m. time slot, and then they get promoted to have admin access. You can also do this with Azure RBAC as well. So people don't have to have permanent admin rights, not just in the directory, but also with Azure RBAC. So take a look into this super valuable um, and super like it's low cost because you only need to buy it for your administrators it's low to implement like there's not a lot of work to do but like the benefit you get is humongous because you're really reducing your exposure by not having any permanent admins all right um how am i doing on time okay i'm in the home stretch uh access reviews so typically when people move between you know, different roles and stuff like that in the company. Like we never, we're really good about giving them access to what they need, but we're not so good about taking access away. So access reviews, you can have the business unit that owns that group go through and approve people and you can do it quarterly or monthly, or whatever you guys need to do. It's all web-based, super easy. And then you can approve it that the person still needs access to whatever app they're getting to, or you can deny it and, um, you know, kick them out of the group. So one of my customers, had a really good idea and they said like hey we we um we're thinking about getting rid of our vpn solution but we don't really know who uses this because like we grant people access and people use it because it's there maybe like i don't know so what you can do is you can do an access review where the users themselves 
self-attest that they need access. So a bunch of their users were able to be like, no, I don't need this. I don't use a VPN ever. So take me out of the group. And they were able to kind of like cut down on who actually had VPN access and didn't actually really need it. So lots of cool stuff you can do here um, with this. Um, this kind of falls into our governance space. We partner with uh, Amata, SailPoint, Saviant for this, um, some, some of the more advanced like entitlement stuff and certifications and all this workflow stuff. So we don't do any of that in Azure AD, but you can look to one of our partners that can kind of help help with that. And then last, last uh, use case I want to touch on here is uh, the development side. So this is an area I probably knew the least about, but uh, basically uh, Azure AD is built on all open standards and the Microsoft Graph. So all the protocols there, right? OAuth, OpenID Connect, SAML, SKIM. This is all like industry standard stuff. There's no internal like Microsoft protocol madness that somebody in Redmond thought up would be a really good thing and they do crazy stuff with it. Like none of that. It's all industry standard stuff. You can uh, develop your own LLB apps against it using the Microsoft Graph, um, which is an API that kind of proxies it to other Microsoft services. So we kind of hide some of that stuff from you, like you don't have to know how to get things out of SharePoint versus Exchange or whatever you're trying to do. You can kind of do this um, through the Graph API, which is a pretty standard thing. And you only need one access token to really do this. So here's kind of an example of going through and grabbing a user's profile. So we're gonna grab this user, Ina, and we're gonna get her job title, which is she's a principal program manager, and we can pull her photo, which might be coming from a different directory, a different part of the system here, you can see that. And then we want to see, oh, she's a manager. Um, her manager is Tristan, and then she's also a manager. So who's reporting to her? You can see all these people, right? So this is all, these are just graph calls. Um, there's like no stuff you have to do that's like any heavy, like graphs doing all the heavy, heavy lifting for you. And then you can also see what member she is. Like these are just attributes on the user and you can kind of do this from your LLB side. So that's, um, that's kind of the whole Azure AD like, the four pillars here, right? We want to provide seamless access to resources and make it have you have one identity that you can log in with. You want to do this collaboration around either B2B or, or your B2C with your customers. We want to make IT more much more efficient as well as doing that um, enhances their security. So it was kind of like a whirlwind tour of everything that's in Azure AD and kind of like why you want to do some stuff. Um, is there any other topics? We have about, uh, Rebecca, I think we have about five minutes, eight minutes left. Happy to take questions or if there's topics that we think are more interesting that I can come back and maybe do a whole other session, like a deep dive on it. Yeah, it looks like we have uh, four questions. Oh, where did they go? Uh, so I, I can read them out for you if that's easier. <laughs> it's uh, the first one. I don't one... see anything in, in the chat, so. Yeah, it's, there's a question section. Uh, the first one is, what's the difference between AD and Azure AD? Ah, okay. So hopefully that was earlier in the, in the session, but right. AD is your on-prem Active Directory. Um, Azure, or Azure AD is identity as a service, so there's no domain controllers. It's just like we run that for you. Um, that's what powers Office 365 and all that stuff. Cool. Uh, the second one is smart card auth does require federation with ADFS, correct? That is a correct statement. So there's a few scenarios why you would still need ADFS. So smart card auth is one of them, right? Because you're doing the auth against, like we don't have anything natively in Azure AD that does that. The second one would be if you have a third party MFA provider, we don't let you, like we do RSA and Trusona um, and Duo. But if you have something else, um, we don't let you just like plug whatever you want in. So you'd have to use ADFS for that. So those are the two really big reasons why you have to still use ADFS. If you don't have those two requirements, look hard at doing password hashing with seamless SSO. And if that makes you nervous, do PTA with seamless SSO and you can get the same experience without having to do um, ADFS. Cool. Uh, the next question is, do the Azure AD domain services show up as DCs and an AD site in your on-prem Active Directory? They, they, they do not, which is the beauty of it. Because if they're in, so the whole point of that is if they're, in your AD site, like that means your on-prem domain controllers like gotta replicate with that, right? Like you have to replicate that data up there. Um, that means you probably need a, a different AD site for it. Um, you're probably gonna like, I don't know, I'm not, I'm an engineering, so I don't really know, but I'm assuming we like charge you for traffic that's going in and out, right, of, of Azure. Um, so like now you have to worry about replication and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, no, so it's totally different. Like that's the whole beauty of it because we stage it. 
it should look very similar because it's staged from your Azure Active Directory because your AD synced to Azure AD and then we staged another Active Directory off of your Azure AD. So we kind of like hop through, but it's totally isolated. So you don't have to worry about any of that stuff and patching and all that we take care of. And then you basically can get the protocols that you need in Azure I, Azure PaaS, right? Like you, if you have an app that you guys are gonna lift and shift out of your on-prem data center to Azure and it only does LDAP off, that's where you can use Azure AD domain services and you can just leverage that. You don't have to deal with putting a domain control up there, doing the site-to-site -site VPN and like all that stuff. So that you, it, your on-prem AD has no idea that Azure AD domain services exists. Cool, so two more questions. Uh... The next one is, so privileged identity management is not a general solution for temporary local admin for end users on their PCs, like CyberArk or similar. No, it's not. So privileged identity management is only for your admin accounts. And again, it's only for your I Azure identity accounts. It has nothing to do with like your on-prem AD, domain admins, enterprise admins, all that kind of stuff. CyberArk does that. We have another feature called uh, privileged access management. Uh, listen, once Azure AD has PIM, AD has PAM. I'm in engineering. I don't name this stuff. This is what it is. But that's basically built on MIM. And you can kind of do a similar thing where you, that's like the whole Red Forest stuff. And you have like the, it's, I think it's called ESAE. It's like the enhanced security forest. So yeah, so you're correct. PIM is only for your Azure AD or like Azure R, like admin roles in Azure. It has nothing to do with your on-prem. It has nothing to do with end user logins or any of that kind of stuff. And the last question is, uh, joined late, so this may have already been answered, but for a customer who already has Office 365 with free Azure AD, who is starting to build in Azure, what is the best way to migrate AD itself from on-prem to Azure? And then a little bit more context is that they currently have site-to-site -site VPN and are using on-prem DC for domain joins, DNS, et cetera. Okay, as a mouthful. So uh, Azure AD Connect, so if you have Office 365 already, which I, did they say they have Office 365 already? It sounds like they did. Yes. Okay. You're good news. You have Azure AD. Like you already got it. And the only difference between the free version and like the premium is you paid a license. Like it's still the same Azure AD underneath. Like there's no like difference from that perspective, right? You just get more features when you have the premium version. Okay. So you have that. You can look at what's called EMS, which is Enterprise Mobility Suite, which I think went into M365, which is the more like Uber thing of all kinds of licensing stuff. Um, talk to your licensing professional account team people for pricing and what you need and all that kind of stuff. But okay, so what you probably wouldn't want is Azure AD Premium, and you can do like the conditional access and get all your SaaS apps and self service password reset and all that kind of good stuff in there. And then if you have like you said, like the, is it out LDAP? Is that what you said? I'm sorry, I can't remember. It's it said that they currently have site-to-site -site VPN and are using their on-prem DC for domain joins, DNS, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, so like that still stuff's probably gonna exist your on-prem stuff today. You probably don't need the site-to-site -site VPN. You can get rid of that and you can use Azure AD domain services. That way you don't have to manage like that replication and express route or however you're getting all that data up to, right? You have to get that data from your DC in your domain, in your data center up to Azure somehow. Like that's a pain in the butt. You don't have to do that. You can just use Azure AD domain services, which will basically give you the two domain controllers in Azure, and then you can hook those up to your Azure IaaS and PaaS stuff um, and do like LDAP domain join up there, which again, this is gonna be more for like services, like, right? It's not, you're not gonna have clients joining their machines to Azure AD domain services, but we also have Azure AD join where you can take Windows 10 and you can join it directly to, um, to Azure AD. Awesome. That was the last question. Uh, so thank you for everybody who tuned in and thank you very much, Mark, for uh, presenting. Sure. And if you guys have more questions, feel free to reach out to me on uh, Twitter. I'm at Mark Morrow or um, yeah, like let me know or put in the comments or something. If you guys have topics you want to go deeper on like Azure MFA or how does SaaS apps work or you know, all that kind of stuff, we're happy to kind of talk to you guys more about it and kind of do like a whole hour on a specific topic if it makes sense for you guys. Cool. Well, this concludes the recording. Thank you.